In the last lecture, we discussed the influence of values, and in particular, Schwartz's discussion of the theory of values. Here, we begin to apply it to see how values influence behaviors. Therefore, in this lecture, we'll focus on the application of values into more concrete settings, how different cultural and political values can influence attitudes about social responsibility and actual corporate behavior. So when it comes to discussing this more directly in the context of CSR, there's lots of evidence that personal values can be used as a good instrument for studying individual perceptions of social responsibility. For example, the influence of personal values on ethical decision-making has been really well recognized. Hemingway and McLaughlin, for example, in 2004, studied the effects of a manager's personal values on their attitudes and behaviors regarding social responsibility. Hemingway argued that personal values can motivate social entrepreneurship. Recent empirical findings suggest that altruistic values are typically associated with higher levels of moral awareness and so make a positive contribution to ethical decision making and improve CSR programs. While egoistic values are often associated with lower levels of uh, moral awareness and so actually hurt ethical decision making and reduce the likelihood of the effectiveness or even the implementation of social responsibility initiatives. Additionally, when researchers have pointed out that the values of, say, pro-green attitudes, they're mainly concentrated with collectivist value domains, whereas those relevant to non-green attitudes concentrated on individualistic value domains. There is some debate about this. Others have claimed that individuals with more collectivist values are broadly concerned with a business's compliance with social norms and seldom its economic performance, but there are also findings that show that collectivist values correspond with stakeholder views, highlighting, for example, the welfare of people and employee morality in companies, but not to the exclusion of economic performance. To better understand the relationships between individual values and social responsibility based on the research, we can think about it in terms of a pyramid of values. Individual ethical values form the basis of the pyramid, sustaining individual and corporate behavior. Individual ethical values refer to individual perceptions of what's right, and these are based on feelings of justice and duty towards others and, say, the environment. Here, individual ethical values refer not only to corporate members, but to other stakeholders from the surrounding environment. The organizational literature often defines the relationship between individual and corporate values as dialogues. So management styles that can reflect personal level values that affect and are affected by predominant culture, corporate culture. Logically, individuals must perceive ethics and social responsibility to be important before they embrace ethical and responsible behavior at a corporate level or an organizational level. Their perceptions are affected by their ethical values. Similarly, organizations must first commit to social responsibility before they undertake greater CSR-based behavior. So the level of organizational commitment to CSR also depends on its overall codification of ethical values. So at the second level, individual ethical values are accumulated and turned into organizational ethical values. These organizational values can be seen as the collective programming of minds that differentiates one organization from another. They're shared values, basically, that govern corporate interactions or organizational interactions with different stakeholder groups. And so these values are a major component of organizational culture. And principles responsible for the successful management and performance of any organization. So Kandawal and Mohendra defined values as beliefs held in high esteem by members of an organization regarding the means and ends that an organization ought to justify in its operations. And not only that, but also a common identity and shared sense of purpose for the organization and its members. Charles and Jones in 2001 divided values into terminal values, the ends, and instrumental values, the means. 
So terminal values are often reflected in an organization's mission and goals, whereas instrumental values are typically embodied in the norms, its rules of code and conduct. The functions at the values at the organizational level are also about external adaptation and internal integration. So this shapes an organization's philosophy, its process, and its goals. So if we extrapolate this pyramid model of social responsibility in an organization, we can find that it's driven by virtue ethics perspective, coming back to Aristotelian ethics. Virtue ethics argues that the virtues of organizations help them carry out their roles to overcome conflicts and be consistent with the goals of the organization. Murphy, for example, found that virtue ethics is driven by a number of dimensions. First, virtue ethics is often driven by individuals, so it's individuals' values and priorities, not necessarily conscious decisions and strategy. Second, However, no matter whether they're derived, these values create behavioral habits that over time in individual and organizational settings, ethical practice or the lack thereof just becomes a norm. Third, as people begin to practice ethical behaviors, others see these behaviors and replicate them. So they witness and imitate the behavior as a way of fitting in or socially conforming to expectations. Fourth, on average, people will do what's expected, not much more and not much less. Fifth, these behavioral expectations are tied to the community. Now the community might be the organization they work in, or it might be a broader definition of community. And fifth and sixth and finally, what really motivates people will come back to their personal goals, whether that be for individualistic recognition and excellence or collectivist social approval. So, and in this understanding that much of what people do is motivated by our goals and interest in social conformity or individual success, we can begin to see broader cultural themes influencing social responsibility and what it means. Individualist societies, for example, view ethics as something suggesting that people are equal and deserve the same rights, which then leads to the need to regulate individual behavior explicitly. In more communitarian societies, though, ethical decisions are typically made based on shared values, which are bound into a network of social obligations and relationships. For example, European CSR is more driven by society-wide shared values and social responsibility and less by company-specific codes of ethics. In short, what CSR means will depend on where you are. So if we take a simple cultural difference between individualistic and collectivist societies, we can see some important implications to CSR initiatives and organizational behaviors. Research suggests that in collectivist societies, CSR initiatives tend to emphasize environmental and social justice. We can contrast this with individual societies. According to Jackson in 2000, a high level of individualism and universalism, for example, U.S. society, is likely to need higher levels of regulation of individual behavior in an explicit way. As a consequence, codes of ethics are more common in the U.S. than in Europe, making American business ethics often seem rather legalistic. These different value systems also result in fundamental differences in who organizations define as valuable stakeholders. For example, if you ask whom the organizational is responsible to, you can get a range of responses depending on the individual, individualist versus collectivist orientations of cultures. There are always different economic, legal, and societal stakeholders that organizations have to manage, but it's the emphasis that matters a great deal. For example, in most American business school textbooks, you'll find an explicit statement that the only stakeholder that matters is the shareholder, because it is, that is who the business is directly responsible to. However, they will argue that it is in a business's best interests to be socially responsible because that will ultimately maximize shareholder value. 
However, by contrast in most British and European business textbooks, they'll define stakeholder value differently, situating different types of stakeholders into a mix of value. All of these areas contribute importantly to the development of CSR and ultimately to respond to the serious challenges that the world faces. So, for example, laws have been drafted that promote socially responsible behaviors by companies. International organizations promote particular principles. And so organizations have adopted CSR mission statements and programs and are sharing their efforts through sustainability reports. NGOs have contacted companies and pointed out how they could even behave in more responsible ways and academics while well, we've analyzed it all. So understanding the connections made between values, ethics, and expectations for CSR is absolutely vital. These codes of conduct also often evolve into codified national and international standards for industries talked about as private law. But political affiliation is a natural measure for, of preferences for social responsibility. In the U.S., for example, the Democratic Party platform places more emphasis on CSR-related issues such as environmental protection, anti-discrimination laws, and affirmative action, employee protection, and helping the poor and disadvantaged. A 2007 National Consumers League survey found that 96% of Democrats believe that Congress should ensure that companies address social issues compared to just 65% of Republicans. In addition, Hong and Kosovesky show a very big difference, a significant difference between Democratic and Republican investment managers in their portfolio holdings on socially responsible companies. Recent papers have also found that political views affect corporate variables such as leverage and investment, as well as the decisions of individual investors on whether they even participate in the stock market itself. So, let's take a look at some actual examples. Starbucks, for example, was found to overperform in comparison to average companies with regards to social responsibility, and Wendy's was found to underperform. These are also found to be typical of liberal and conservatively owned firms. So, social responsibility is a affected as well by the industries that organizations are in. Globally, as a contrast in industry and industry's values, the oil and gas industry performed incredibly badly with regard to environmental social responsibility. However, the computer software industry, by comparison, performs with excellence with regard to environmental social responsibility. This means we can begin to build a, an set of industry profiles for different types of social responsibility. It can let us create expectations to evaluate. So when we compare companies across industries, we can be able to predict their performance, but within industries, we can compare organizations and their relative value on any aspect of social responsible performance that would be relevant to the organization. These kinds of comparisons can lead to different value propositions for different organizations organizations in any industry. But these then are also typically tied to the firm's general policy values, political values, or at least the values it supports with its advocacy and with its leadership. All of this makes it easier to predict and easier to evaluate. Cost issues is where CSR begins to get particularly controversial because we can start to measure social responsibility in terms of financial cost, but also in terms of relational costs as we begin to get conflicts in comparing apples and oranges. So when we think about this all together, CSR and this, these fuzzy concepts of values, of priorities, of evaluation start to become much more concrete and much more sensible when we consider culture, politics, and CSR as factors that indicate performance and indicate organizational behavior, what we can expect of it.